everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Ania Radzikowska and for me this is pretty new experience, so I'm happy that I can share it with you and I'm glad to be here. I would like to tell you the story about Kanban spirit and the implementation of the Kanban spirit. Previously this presentation had a lot of slides with numbers, graphs and infographics, but I decided to remove them all because probably during these two days you will see a lot of them. Instead for that, I will tell you the story because, uh, as you know, we Kanban people and Kanban trainers tell a lot of stories. So maybe let's start with a very, very short story of who I am. As I said, my name is Anna and I'm the storyteller. And not only by hobby and by what I'm doing on a daily basis, but also by my um, education. And um, I finished the Faculty of History at the Aguilonian University in beautiful city of Krakow, which is already a very old city with a lot of stories. And as a Kanban enthusiast, I need to be a storyteller. And as a Kanban enthusiast, I also need to be a people devotee. Because even if Kanban is very focused on the process, in the center of Kanban are people, and this is how I see it, and this is how I tend to tell people about Kanban. If you really do Kanban, you need to love people, otherwise it simply doesn't work. And I believe that people are the most incredible creatures in all over the world. And today I would like to tell you the story about the people I met and the story of who we became. At the beginning, there was a group of people who barely knew each other. We have been told that we have a project to deliver, we have a product to build, that we have one and a half year for it, and we've been told good luck. So actually we didn't knew where to start, but we knew that we'll have to stay strong together. And at the beginning when we said and we had to decide what method we'll choose, we thought that Kanban will be the best choice for us. First of all, because we wanted to focus on the flow of the process rather than time boxing. Then some of the team members already had some experience with Kanban and also our organizational culture better or better fit for the Kanban method. So we have started and the first month was a honeymoon for us. We did a very, very basic Kanban implementation. So the Kanban board, uh, basic web limits, uh, policies, we set the feedback loops and cadences. And during this first month, we tried to find what will be the most difficult for us. And when we talked about it, we thought that probably the team, because in that shape, it would have never worked before. And requirements from the business, the same as the requirements from the system side were pretty clear for us at that moment. And during um, this first month of work, everything went pretty smoothly and we were ready to deliver the first results of our work. Unfortunately, it was the moment when the first punctuation points arrived. So when we were ready for delivery, we realized that actually there is a lot of blockers which stop us from doing our work. We've been told that infrastructure is not ready. We've been told that system is not ready and we simply cannot deliver what we did. And in the story of the team, it was one of the most difficult moments because after a very fast start, we had to stop and we need to think what we would like to do next. And the most important at that moment was keeping the level of motivation and the level of focus that was required to following what we have started. We couldn't simply sit and say that right now we stop working and until you remove our blockers, we do not do anything. We had to keep working, but on the other hand, we had to stay motivated. And there was one of the meetings of our team, which was very important moment for me and for the whole team. During this meeting, one of the team members told something like this, Anya, to nie my, which means in English, Anya, it wasn't our fault. But actually what I heard that moment was Anya, to nie my, which means Anya, we are drowning. 
And when I realized that, it touched me very deeply and it stayed with me for a very long time. And after that meeting, we met together the next time and we decided that finally we need to do something about the situation. And for us, it was our Kanban spirit lesson number one. So what we decided that we'll implement few rules that will all focus on the psychological safety of the team. I like to quote Josh Karibski in this moment, who says that safety is both a basic human need and a key to unlocking high performance. And we as a team decided that we'll introduce three rules. Rule number one is that you can try. So no matter what happens, no matter how hard it is, you have a right to try and you have a right to make mistake. Rule number two, you can change. No words and no actions are written in stone. If you decide something, you have the right to change your opinion, you have the right to change your mind, and you have the right to change yourself. Rule number three, it's okay to fail. Even if we treat fail as the acronym as the first attempt in learning, it meant for us that we really have right to fail and again it's okay to make mistake until we take the lesson from these mistakes having these rules we could move forward one day one of the developers came to me and he brought me this picture and this picture not only touched me very deeply but also he made me smile and uh, this picture stayed with us until the end of the project and it was with us on our Kanban board. It made us realize that we should live not only our life at home, but we should also live fully our life at work and make this life happy and make this life safe. The changes I mentioned, the changes to our Kanban system were related to strict definition of what we are responsible for and what depends on us. So we started with defining the beginning and the end of the Kanban system we are responsible for. We started with defining where is the uh, moment when the item comes to our workflow and where starts the first unbounded queue and when actually all of the blockers start. This way we told our stakeholders what really depends on the team and what is the part of the process that we cannot be responsible for. It helped the team to keep focus on um, the work they do and also keep the level of motivation because they saw what they can influence and what they cannot. What we have learned during this three months of uh, frozen delivery was that our team can stay strong, can stay focused and can stay motivated, even that we are not able to deliver the results of our work. What we also learned about the business was that our first assumption was incorrect. We don't know requirements and we don't know business as well as we thought we knew. So we also decided that except for the rules that are related to our team only, we need to also introduce some additional rules related to the cooperation and collaboration with business. But we also learned a lot about Kanban itself. First of all, and it was our lesson number two, Kanban is human. Kanban is human, this is the sentence that I read for the first time in Mike Barrow's book, Kanban from the Inside, and it stays with me and it resonates very strongly with me. As I said at the beginning, although the Kanban focuses on the process, it has a human being as a basis and altogether with human being also the respect. So what we started to do, except for doing some changes into the practices and the way we are doing our work, we also focused on the values that Kanban provides to our life. First of all, the transparency. We agreed that we are fully transparent in our team, sometimes probably even over transparent. Uh, our daily Kanban meetings happen uh, every morning on the open floor with 50 or 60 people uh, listening to us. 
so there was even sometimes too much transparency, but we were okay with this. There were no chit chats in the kitchen, there was no hiding secrets uh, within the team. Everything, what happened bad or good, was clearly stated by the team members. With transparency came collaboration and cooperation. So we knew that we have to stay together and we knew that we have to cooperate very closely to achieve the results we wanted to achieve. There was no place for individual heroes. There was a team and team members who wanted to achieve the common goal. The next one was the agreement. And agreement meant for us that everyone in the team has the right, but also the obligation to be part of taking decisions within the team, decisions about the team and also the process. And finally, the respect as the basis of everything we did, respect that comes from inside, but also comes from our actions. So Kanban is human. It was the sentence that stayed with us until the end. And we realized then that we are more than a team, more than just a group of individuals. We realized that we share the same values and we share the same principles. For me personally, there was still one thing which I was missing. And it was principle saying that we need to observe the acts of leadership at every level. That moment, I wasn't yet sure how can I know that these acts of leadership really happen and when I will see the signs of the acts of leadership in my team. But the leadership isn't something that I can impose to the team members. The leadership is something that needs to grow within the team members and it can or sometimes it cannot happen. So I had to stay patient and observe the team. Each storm ends finally and the same with us. The work finally started to flow and I am not sure how many times uh, you are able to see the group of nine people really happy that they can come to work on Saturday they can sit at work on Saturday and people happy that they can finally deliver the results of their hard work. And what happened that moment when we removed the blockers and when the work started to flow was the huge relief. And this relief within the team members was really tangible. And with the relief that we felt came some additional benefits, some of them not so obvious and we didn't expect them. First of all, we unlocked the first feedback loop. And uh, the first feedback loop with the business, of course. Um, this was something that happened when the business, as our client, started to see the results of the work and they could finally also uh, test the results of our work. And they could see how it affects their life. We also then realized that this is the moment when we need to tighten the cooperation with the business. The feedback that we started to receive really sped up our learning because so far the learning was limited to our um, internal group and was limited to the system that we worked in. Now we received a lot of feedback um, coming into the system, but also the feedback resulted from the work that we delivered. It helped us a lot in improving our work and it helped us a lot in improving um, our Kanban system. We also uh, could see improved metrics because again, the metrics that we gathered so far were focused only uh, on the system within which we work. Right now we could start to gather the metrics uh, for the system end to end, so from the idea until the delivery. Uh, altogether with these metrics, uh, we could see that uh, we have additional work item types like uh, work enhancement and defects, unfortunately. And we could start to measure separately lead time for all of these work item types. Uh, we also finally saw a huge improvement in our delivery and in our work. Our lead time, for example, decreased in uh, three months from 150 days to 67. Our throughput increased from zero. To 70 items per delivery. Uh, so it was um, again a huge motivation boost for the team. 
And the last but not least, uh, we decreased the waste. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, we had a huge amount of work piling up before the delivery, uh, which we couldn't uh, release. And for me as a project manager and product owner at the time, uh, this was the work that I had to manage. This was the work that I had to report and I had to remember about. Also for the team, it was this invisible burden because what we were afraid the most uh, was the fact that this work waiting for release may one day become obsolete and no one will need it anymore. So we removed all of this waste related to this invisible inventory. And as I mentioned, it was a moment um, almost after four months in the project uh, that we had to revisit our cooperation with business. And uh, people from business were really open to it. And together with them, we organized a group of advisors and advocates. Advisors on one hand, because um, it was a group of around 20 representatives of uh, business people who were the experts in the work and who could advise us not only if we do our work properly and if the requirements we gather are proper, but also they helped us a lot in the in terms of prioritization um, because when we uh, suggested to them that maybe this is the next item we should pick up sometimes we received the feedback okay this is really nice but you know we will see the um, results of this work only in three or four months if you do this one for us we'll see the results immediately so this way we were able to really deliver valuable um, items to the business and the work that they see was effective. They were also our advocates because sometimes the cooperation uh, between IT and business is pretty difficult and these people who could work with us and who could sit with us and talk about problems not only from the business side but also from the um, developer side understood each others better and when they came to their teams they could be the advocates of our project. Also for us as a project team, it was very uh, beneficial because we could leave our project shell. Uh, so far we have been closed within this shell and we tend to don't see the world outside. Uh, having people from business on board uh, helped us to evolve and grow um, together with them. And finally for me, Lesson number three came one day because, as I told you, I wonder for a long time, is act of leadership at every level even possible? For me, it was one of the most difficult, um, it is one of the most difficult uh, Kanban principles. And as mentioned, I didn't know how can I be sure that it happened, but it happened one day. We've been sitting uh, on our daily meeting and I usually sat very close to the Kanban board. Uh, we've been discussing one of the uh, work items and the developers told that they have finished work on this item. So what they did, I picked up the post-it and I moved it to the testing column. And everyone looked at me like, Anna, but what the hell are you doing? And I said, but you said you have finished the work on this item. Yes, but we didn't tell you that we started testing on it. And I said, okay, of course, you are right. I moved it quickly to the development done, not testing in progress. And for me, it was like a ha moment. And I was very, very happy inside. And then I told them, of course, because I realized that taking care for the smallest item on the board and taking care for the smallest piece of work they really take the ownership of work they deliver and take the leadership because they are not afraid to challenge like anyone, even in front of 60 other people listening to it. And when I thought about it, I realized that for me, the leadership consists of three elements, responsibility, integrity, and mentioned ownership. Responsibility, not only for themselves, but responsibility for the whole team, for communication, 
for relation within the team, but also outside the team, with the business, with clients. Responsibility for the process and for the product that we deliver. Then integrity, integrity of words and actions, which means that we do what we said and we say what we want to do. And we are integral internally, but also externally. And finally, the ownership, feeling owner for the process and feeling owner of the product. So not only product owner should take the ownership for the product. The ownership, ownership should be a part of each team member and it should grow in every single person. So responsibility, integrity and ownership are for me the elements of this leadership approach and the visual signs of what I can call the acts of leadership at every level. What's next for me and for the team? The product is over and uh, the team has already spread out. We do not work together on the same product anymore. Of course, we are friends and we meet after work, having fun and enjoy the company, uh, but we don't have the opportunity to sit every day in front of our Kanban board and discuss the work that we deliver. But I truly believe that this Kanban seat, which was built out of the values, out of the principles and the rules that we made together as a team will be taken to the world and can grow into the huge ivy wherever they are thank you anna for telling your story it's very interesting very inspiring glad to see you there yeah good all right very good we've got a couple of questions for you um the first one up is how do you help the leadership the the acts of leadership grow among the team members what did you do to, to help inspire them or get them to sort of take that on you said it was a little surprise but but then you were really happy that they had jumped in yeah uh, thanks Todd, and thanks for the question mm, actually it was a process so as i mentioned it doesn't happen overnight of course uh, this is a very long process and for us it took more than a year to come to this moment uh, when we actually saw this act of leadership. Uh, what I did and how I tried to support, um, as a project manager, I don't feel only responsible for the documentation or approvals and this kind of stuff, but I also want to be uh, responsible for people because uh, I believe that if uh, people are happy and, and motivated, everything will be done perfectly. So um, I wanted them to develop. So what we did um, was developing not only our product, of course, uh, but we also developed each other. Uh, we did um, a lot of internal training. We did a lot of reading. We watched uh, even YouTube videos uh, together from different conferences. And uh, what I always encouraged them was um, speaking loudly what they think. So we had this transparency um, embedded in the project from the very beginning. So um, it was a bit difficult uh, when we met each other for the first time and we didn't know each other. Uh, but then literally sitting together every day, working together and struggling together with the same problems helped us uh, to be the group of people focused on the same goal, uh, but also doing some additional stuff, which was related to training, to developing each other, um, helped um, everyone to grow in this level of leadership. Okay, excellent. Um, the next question, could you describe in a bit more detail, um, how did you build cooperation with business folks and what were the tangible benefits from that? Thanks. So um, 
when we started to realize that we actually need more business people in our project was after six or seven months when we've been already there uh, we started to deliver and as i mentioned we saw the first effects of delivery which were defects and change requests and uh, of course some positive feedback was there too but uh, some negative effects uh, we have seen uh, also so um, what we decided then we, we started to talk to business more closely and we asked them if they really want to participate uh, seeing what what happens in the project and um, if they can do something to help us so yes of course they uh, have been really happy that they can join what was important for me um, was to have this group of uh, engaged people who were volunteers so i didn't want to have people that were pointed out by their managers uh, but someone who really wanted to do something and who wanted to learn something new uh, because uh, you have to remember if you work in it uh, and uh, you start to come to business people it's usually a lot of walls already uh, built in uh, by, by previous generation and sometimes by history and uh, we had to start from removing these walls and from removing this kind of cooperation and communication obstacles so uh, we, we had these people on board which was already a great success and then we started to build um, like end-to-end -end kanban system so it was a really customer Kanban from the moment when idea came to the system to the moment when it left the, the system as the delivery item. And uh, in this process from end to end, uh, our business folks have been engaged. And um, when any of them um, really participated in analysis in gathering requirements, uh, we invited them to our meetings, uh, to our daily Kanban standouts. We invited them to our retrospective meetings. So um, that time they have been part of the team. We, we didn't really differentiate. And um, what we also started to notice was the change of um, the behavior and attitude because uh, at the beginning everyone told us that no standardization is possible in this project. We have 120 clients, everyone's specific, everyone's perfect. And so uh, when people started to sit together and they started to cooperate, not only with us as delivery team, but also they started to work all together. Uh, they saw that uh, even these 120 clients can overlap at some point. So we started not only to improve our delivery system, but also uh, their upstream system. Uh, so the very tangible effect of uh, this work was creating end-to-end -end uh, customer Kanban system and uh, gathering uh, different uh, level of metrics uh, for, for the upstream, for downstream and for the whole system. Um, and uh, finally, what we could see was uh, that uh, the quality of our work as delivery team increased uh, dramatically because uh, we had experts on board um, and we could leverage this, uh, this knowledge of uh, 20 plus people that supported us. All right, well, great, great. Uh, the next question up. You mentioned some of the improvements to the process. Could you provide some examples of practices you introduced and how did they affect the results? What are some of the specific things that you did and what were some of the ones you felt had the, the biggest impact? Yes, yeah, so um, at the beginning, the biggest impact had um, our focus on blockers. So we started with really clustering the blockers, managing the blockers and uh, making them transparent from day one. So the moment uh, we saw the blocker appears, uh, we started to communicate it like, to everyone uh, who could help us because at the beginning, we also sometimes didn't know how, who we can really address uh, the problems we have. So uh, blockers managing uh, and transparency in uh, communicating to blockers was one of the uh, practices we started with. And uh, this really helped us um, looking from the metrics perspective. So the delete that I mentioned, which decreased from 150 days to, to 60 days in uh, three months. The throughput that increased and uh, really stayed stable, uh, the flow efficiency that uh, increased and the waiting time um, that we previously experienced was also um, not removed, but 
decreased that much. And then what we um, did was um, identifying, working hardly on identifying the work item types. So uh, we start to treat our work uh, homogeneously. We started to see different work item times and having them, uh, we could really um, also apply different classes of services. And it helped us in improving our planning uh, because um, it was not only our delivery team, of course, it was a business and business worked in different cycles. So as I mentioned, 120 clients um, and they had different reporting cycles throughout uh, the whole year, so from January to December. Uh, we also had uh, uh, the peak of work uh, within the whole year, so there were four peaks of work and we had to plan accordingly, not only for our work, but also for business work. And uh, we had to take care also for, for the team uh, so they don't sit idle on one hand or on, they are not overrun on the other hand. And the third, I think the most important uh, practice that we introduced uh, was building uh, very clear policies around the dependencies. So um, especially at the beginning, we noticed a lot of dependencies and we noticed that actually there is no single step in the whole system that do we have the full ownership uh, for, for it. And uh, every time we need to wait for approval, every time we need to wait for decision. So this whole decision and approval chain was really, really long. And there was always someone uh, wanted to add something to our work. Uh, so we started to work on the transparency also in this governance model and uh, we started to show how this uh, long approval and decision chain affects our work and affect the waiting time. Uh, so um, having this, uh, we started to improve metrics and what we did next uh, was um, actually removing the speculative demand that started to appear. Um, because you can, imagine, you can imagine you have one and a half year project uh, where you deliver 90, 90 um, reports and uh, always happens that someone will come and tell you, okay, maybe you will do one additional report for me. Yeah, you, you know, it's just very small report, you can do it. So uh, the speculative demand started to just uh, pop up uh, out of nowhere sometimes. Uh, but having this metrics, having these dependencies managed pretty well, we were able to really reduce uh, the numbers of this kind of uh, demands. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciated that story. It's really uh, got us something talking about the Kanban spirit. So great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was great to be here.